Yes, sir. Okay. So you can see me and you can hear me. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Next thing, let me just share my screen. Are you able to see my screen? Yes, sir. It's loading, sir. Okay. So sorry, sir. Uh, it's coming in black screen. Could you please yeah. uh, stop the sharing and uh, share once more? Uh, hold on, hold on. It's going to come. Yes, sir. Okay, sir. Yes, sir. No. Yeah, perfect, sir. Thank you. All under control. It's good to start. Yes, yes sir. Perfect. Sir. All right. So uh, good. Good afternoon, everyone. It's it's great to be here. Thanks for that uh, uh, marvelous introduction, uh, Joel. So. Thank uh, you, sir. What we decided to speak on, uh, what I decided to speak on today is applying positive psychology for a better life. Now, before I, before I begin and, and get into any of this, I want to just tell you that this being a very short session, it's going to be about 45 minutes. I will share a set of things with you, a set of ideas with you. Look at it as a, a box of, of, of brushes or a cup of brushes. You will pick up and use what works for you. And I think that's the best way to, to squeeze out as much as you can from this, uh, from this uh, talk. Uh, if you have questions, you can put them up on the chat screen. I'll keep looking at the chat screen and uh, I think so will Joel. I'll pick up the questions in the end in case they are not uh, answered uh, you know, by, the, by the end of my talk. Yes, sir, sure, sir. Okay, so um, that's, the, that's the universal symbol of positive psychology. For those of you who are hearing this term for the for the first time, and I remember once when I was traveling to the US, I stopped by at uh, Schiphol Airport in Amsterdam. This guy was looking at my passport and he asked me a few questions. He asked me what I do. And then when I told him I'm a positive psychologist, he said, so is there something called negative psychology? Well, there is something called negative psychology, which is about looking at, looking at problems, looking at trauma, looking at uh, you know, issues. And there is a school of thought which says, do look at problems and that will also give you useful solutions to live a better life. But today that's not what we're here to do. We're here to look at how positive psychology and looking at flourishing and the good things. So this is one simple way for you to define and understand positive psychology, which is it's a study of what makes life, study of a good life. That's also what I mentioned and talk about in my book. I think any time is incomplete without these two names and I'm a, I'm a big fan of putting, putting faces to names so that's what Martin Seligman looks like and that's what uh, that name is pronounced as Mihai Csikszent Mihai so he's a Hungarian uh, American psychologist so these two are leading names in the in the field of positive psychology and those of you who are uh, I know that a lot of I think you are mute, sir. Okay, the speaker will be joining back. I think there is some technical glitch. So meanwhile, uh, participants, you can fill in, uh, like, no, you can just comment on the chat box. How was the session? Like, no, uh, those who attended the morning session, how was it? Hello, can you hear me? Uh, yes, sir, we can hear you. Thank you. Okay, yes, one sir. second. I, I don't know what happened. I think I just got disconnected. Yeah, are you able to see my screen? Yes, sir, it's loading, sir. It's loading, sir. Mm -mm -mm. Yes, sir. Now it's visible. Visible? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. So let me just go back. Yeah, so this is where we were. So uh, I was saying that um, Martin Seligman and Mihai Cheeks and Mihai were leading names in positive psychology. Those of you who studied this, there are also other names. Uh, you know, there's Barbara Fredrickson, um, there's Abraham Maslow, uh, there's Carol Dweck, and and so on. So we, I won't, I won't go into those details and and bore you with it. 
But I, I want to say this, while, uh, you know, Seligman and, and Mihai, they said, you know, sometime, uh, you know, you should, you should remember that the whole field of positive psychology came into the picture, was accepted as a field of psychology only around 1998, which I'm sure is after many of us here were born. So it's, pretty, it's a pretty recent affair, okay? And sometime in 2000, these two gentlemen defined positive psychology more accurately and said that, look, it's a scientific study of, of flourishing, of uh, flourishing at multiple levels, you know, and, and performing well at multiple levels and so on. So having said that, I, I'm a strong believer that, uh, you know, positive psychology has, though this, you know, books would say it happened in 1998 and that's when it became a part of the, you know, uh, formal field of psychology and so on. I think positive psychology has been there forever. For example, in many of the religions, which, which I'm sure some of us follow, where we are taught something like, um, like gratitude, if you're taught to be gra grateful for what you have and what you've been given, I think that's, that's positive psychology. And that's been, that's been around forever. If your parents told you, uh, you know, maybe, maybe a lot of our ancestors told their children, do what you're good at, focus on, on your strengths. Well, that's, that's positive psychology. Any approach to living, your, living a good life is positive psychology. So, uh, you know, all the stoic philosophers, Seneca and Marcus Aurelius, I think what they were really talking about is, is nothing but positive psychology. Maybe it wasn't called that back then, but, but that's, that's what it was. So for a history, just remember it's been around forever and uh, anything else that you read is just, is just formal agreement on, on how things have changed and when it became a formal field and so on. Okay, so let me stop with the introduction of positive psychology there. I think that's, that's more than enough for a start. Here's something for you to understand, going back to that, that guy at the, at the security check or immigration at, at, at Schiphol Airport in Amsterdam. The traditional psychology basically looked at bringing people who had a problem back to zero. You know, many of the, the psychologists realized if you take a depressed person and you sort of remove the depression, you don't necessarily get a happy person. You probably get, you know, you bring a person from minus six to zero and you probably get a, a neutral person. But what positive psychology does is that it's about bringing people from, from zero to plus six. Most of the time, my clientele are people who are already, you know, doing things in life. And even, even in that category, I mostly work with performers. So um, there are a lot of psychologists out there who think traditional psychology is outdated and, uh, you know, psychotherapy doesn't hold water and so on. I, I'm not one of them. In fact, I'm a strong believer that psychotherapy has its own place. It's, it's, it's like saying, you know, if you're getting coached on, on running faster, but suddenly you, you have an accident and you break your leg, you have to come back to zero. You have to be able to stand up to walk and then start running again. You know, so if you have a breakdown, if you have a problem, if you have a problem mentally, you have to first come back to zero. And for that, perhaps, uh, you know, psychotherapy and uh, traditional psychology is more helpful. So do keep this in mind. Uh, positive psychology is not saying throw the other things out of the window, okay? One big idea in positive psychology is, um, you know, this, this, whole, this whole session is about how do you use it to live a better life. Uh, by the way, that's, that's Anand Schwarzenegger, in case you didn't recognize him. So it's about identifying strengths. And he, he's, he's, I think, one guy who's really looked at his strength, uh, became Mr. Universe, became a bodybuilder, uh, won the Mr. Olympia several times, then used his strategy and the same strengths to become an actor. And the strengths were basic things. They weren't about bodybuilding. They were about working hard. They were about, uh, you know, being committed. They were about thinking big and so on. And then he used the same thing to become a politician. So this idea of strengths is very fundamental to positive psychology. Now, there are a number of ways to do this. A trained coach or psychologist will be able to take you through a structured interview to identify your strengths. Uh, you have assessment and development centers which help you do that, which many organizations run. Uh, if you want to do a psychometric sort of assessment, uh, the Clifton Strengths, there's, a, there's, a, there's an assessment called the Clifton Strengths, which one of the, is one of the most popular ones. That's something which you can do. But the fact is that 
many times the the regular joe on the street does not have access to these things and if you still want to find out your strengths just try this out so look at what kind of compliments do you keep getting you know if people keep telling you oh wow you always solve problems when i come and tell you or people keep telling you that you know you're so good at this look at look at the kind of compliments that you receive that's a great indicator of of the kind of strengths that you have secondly look at what people seek you out for do you have a lot of friends who keep calling you for advice on on, on which restaurant to go eat in you have a lot of friends asking you uh, you know which book to read next so this is another good indicator of what your strengths might be all right um uh, here's another big thing to find out your strengths what do you feel you're good at and this is what i've noticed with a lot of people the people who are doing well in a field and who have a particular strength forget about the strength they first of all feel that they're really good at it like usain bolt feels that he's a good athlete and i think that that feeling is 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 very foundational to to it being a strength and finally uh you can also try this out which is what do you what do you really enjoy doing what do you look forward to doing on say evenings and weekends i think these are good ways to find out what your strengths are so before i continue it will be good to to watch some of you you know share your strengths on the chat screen i'll 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 take a look at them uh meanwhile i have paid to do we have to cure for mental illness okay there are some questions here i'm going to pick them up uh, later i think some of them might be answered while i while i go through this uh gravita says assertiveness is a strength somebody else says empathetic uh somebody else says multi phase quick learner another person also says dr rashmi says assertive somebody else says time time management so there you go so that's that's an easy simple way for you to find out what your strengths are okay look at compliments look at what people seek you out for look at what you feel that you're good at and uh what you really enjoy doing and then you know look at ways for you to use that strength and i think all these things about finding the right field career counseling looking at getting into the, into the you know uh, into the right job in your life i think this idea of looking at what you're good at what your strengths are and finding a way to to deploy that or, or to make money out of it or to live out of it i think is is great uh okay now look at this couple what it reminds me of is a is a date this is an, another interesting idea which is related to um positive psychology and the idea of strengths and i i think i should just share this with you before we before we move ahead uh i have i let me just share this with you i i was i was at this pub restaurant called hard rock cafe in in bangalore i i live in bangalore so i'm sitting there in this on this neighboring table there's this guy who's listening to every song they play it, it's hard rock cafe so those of you who haven't been there they play a lot, lot of rock music okay and they also particularly play a lot of classic rock so this guy sitting there i think they were boyfriend girlfriend or husband and wife i wasn't sure and he's enjoying the music and this girl is sitting there not really enjoying being there she's quiet so he's not talking much to her everything that he's saying is about the next song he's saying this song is by brian adams this song is by the beatles this song is by somebody else you know and and giving her some facts and factoids about the song and this girl is sitting there getting bored and each time a new song comes he's singing along he's having a great time and she's getting bored and she's becoming quieter and you can i could tell from her face she's probably also getting more uh, you know irritated now that's that's the that's the opposite of a strength state what happens in a strength state is i mean that that's a date what i just described to you at hard rock cafe that's a date where the guy is getting to use his strength because he understands rock music he enjoys it and he's listening to it but the girl is not getting to do any of it she's probably getting to feel more and more miserable about her ignorance about a certain kind of music imagine this the guy really likes music and maybe what that girl really liked was to cook amazing food and entertain guests at home maybe that's that was her strength so if that's the case a good strength date to have would be to call people home for a music afternoon where the wife cooks 
and then she can talk about what she cooked and where she got it from and uh, the guy gets to play music for the for all the guests now that's what is a strength state so if you're in a relationship try out a strength state and by the way if you're not in a relationship don't think this is not just a relationship thing you can have a strength state with your grandmother so if your grandmother was uh, uh, maybe your grandfather was an army officer and your grandmother got to travel with her him to various parts of the country and she's had these amazing set of experiences living in different parts of india perhaps living in uh, kashmir and um, you know cold places and being part of different stories you know army people have a lot of stories you can have a strength state with your grandmother by calling all your friends home and allowing your grandmother to speak allowing her to share her stories with with everybody you know even that's a strength state so one of the great ways to to exploit to use positive psychology in the area of strength is to have strength dates with people and and that's a great way to improve relationships okay so uh, that's something about strengths hmm this is a <laughs> this is a meme that i i saw recently uh, i want to just introduce you to this idea of paradoxical intention and you know i was telling you that um positive psychology has been around forever uh thanks for all the lovely compliments on the chat screen by the way i'm 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 looking at them i'll look at them more closely as we as we move ahead okay so i was telling you about uh, positive psychology being around forever so here's this cat saying come on in a piece i don't have all day now this idea of paradoxical intention was you know was created by i mean at least well defined and written about by uh, this writer called viktor frankl Viktor Frankl was in the Auschwitz camp and he's written this very popular book called Man's Search for Meaning. If you have time you should read that book. It's a great book on on personal development. If you search for it on Amazon you'll you'll find one or two books. There's another book called Man's Search for Ultimate Meaning. That's not the book. The book to read is called Man's Search for Meaning, okay, by Viktor Frankl. So what paradoxical intention does is it sort of helps you heighten a particular symptom eventually to get rid of it. Okay, now here's this cat trying to experience inner peace. but he's getting irritated that that inner peace is not coming you know i'm sure you've seen you know, uh, this this gentleman off late now you can use paradoxical intention for a number of things you can use it for example i have helped a lot of my clients use it to fall asleep those of you who have insomnia try this out if you don't have a medical condition and if you don't need medication this is a good thing to try out we tend to fall asleep faster when we don't want to sleep okay but when you go to bed and you're trying to sleep you just don't fall asleep and then you're getting stressed that you're not falling asleep and then you're saying oh my god please help me fall asleep and the more you do this the more tensed you are and the more unlikely you are to fall asleep and then you're feeling disappointed with yourself that you're not falling asleep and that further reduces the chances of you going to sleep so instead of that if you go to bed saying i want to stay awake till 3 o'clock and i i shared this with somebody over the phone um last week he hasn't gotten back to to me yet but i know that it works for a lot of people you go to bed saying i am not going to sleep before suppose you go to bed at 10 o'clock say i am not going to sleep before 3 o'clock before 3 a.m. and when you're awake you're feeling good because you know you have time and that when that when you take off that load people tend to relax it's also very popular popularly used i've used it with a lot of people to to get over performance anxiety any kind of performance anxiety whether it's being on stage uh, whether it's um, you know not being able to play a musical instrument whether it's sport whether you're just about to run and and you have performance anxiety uh, whether it's uh, sexual performance anxiety when the pressure goes away and i have noticed this repeatedly with people like coach when you tell them look it's so difficult to play the guitar in front of my friends and uh, you know family members but when i'm on my own i can play the guitar so well how how interesting right so when you remove when you say that you know i'm going to play the guitar and i'm going to play it wrong and it's okay i'm going to have a i'm going to have fun playing it wrong that's exactly the time when the anxiety goes away and you start playing it well uh by the way the reason i went into this brief lesson on this brief psychology lesson on on performance anxiety on positive uh, on uh, you know paradoxical intention is to tell you about this and how it's connected to positive psychology is um this is something this is one of my own theories it 
It's called the five levels of happiness. There's of course being happy, which all of us know. And sometimes not, you're not happy all the time. Sometimes you're sad, right? And in between these two, there are days when you're just feeling, you're just feeling neutral. Okay, these are, the, these are the indifferent days. You know, you finish the day and was it a happy day? Not really. Was it a sad day? Well, not really. It was, it was just another day. These are the days that you really forget. But beyond this, there's something about called being sad about being sad. And I've noticed this. Sometimes people are sad. They're not feeling great. But worse still, they are disappointed about their sadness. They're feeling sad and they're disappointed that they're feeling sad. This makes you feel even sadder. And there's also another state which is above happiness, which is called being happy about being happy. You know, have you, have you ever had the feeling of, uh, you know, you've got this really bad stomach, your stomach is hurting okay, for whatever reason. And you take a tablet or you drink a lot of water or you do something and then the stomach ache goes away. Now you're feeling, you're feeling relief that the stomach ache's gone away, but you're also feeling happy that you're relieved. You know, so it's like a, it's like a meta model of happiness. And the point is that a lot of times I see people trying so hard to be happy, you know, because there's so many messages online. People are posting pictures on Facebook, talking about their happiness, how happy they are as a family, as, as, as people with their passions, with, with their interests. They're putting up stuff on Instagram and so on. The, the more you try to chase happiness, the more it sort of eludes you. Sometimes when you're just feeling neutral, you might make yourself feel miserable by trying hard to be happy and saying, oh God, why am I feeling neutral? I should be happy. And you're trying everything possible to be happy. And because it's not working, you're gonna feel like, you're gonna feel bad about it. And then you come down the scale. To use paradoxical intention, instead of trying to sleep, try to stay awake, instead of trying to be happy, when you're feeling neutral, say, wow, this is good. Of, 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 of better still, if you're feeling sad and down on a particular day, you get back from work, you get back from college, you're feeling lousy. Just tell yourself, hey, I'm feeling lousy, so what? You know, maybe today's a lousy day, I'm gonna move on. This takes the pressure out of you and makes you feel comfortable feeling lousy, feeling bad. And that actually kickstarts a process of, of positive feelings, which will actually take you to happiness. And maybe then you're so thrilled that you're happy, you're gonna feel happy about being happy, all right? So try this out. Don't try too hard to be happy and feel good. Sometimes it's good to just let yourself be and you'll feel happier by just doing that. Okay, wow, very positive approach. Wow, I'm just reading all the messages. Does this mean accepting the state we are in? Well, that's what Zen and a lot of other philosophies said. Just accept things the way you are, then there's no pressure to be any, anywhere else. And it automatically moves you to a better state, okay? All right, now I, I, I briefly alluded to this idea that there's so much of positive messaging out there, correct? Uh, you wake up in the morning, you open WhatsApp, people have sent all sorts of positive good morning messages. This, um, you know, unfortunately, sometimes the people sending the messages are the, uh, <laughs> are the ones who need it the most. So what do you do? What do you do to move positivity from ideas to action? In fact, just put up on the chat screen, today is, what's today? Today is Saturday. Yeah, Saturday is a weekend. I'm sure a lot of people are, uh, have time to send messages. Those of you who got some message today, any interesting positive message, please put it on the chat screen and uh, keep watching the screen. I'm going to read out something, some of them. Okay. So uh, who's this Kishor Kiran? Thank, thank you very much for putting my Instagram link on, uh, on the chat screen. That's uh, a lot of free promotion. So here are some things which I've seen off late. This is Anthony Robbins, Tony Robbins saying, stay committed to your decisions, but stay flexible in your approach. Okay, very good. This is Elon Musk. Uh, I heard somebody earlier this conference mention, if you're not following Elon Musk, you're not, you know, you're not current enough or something to that effect. He says, I think it is possible for ordinary people to choose to be extraordinary. Now, let, let me not proceed just by looking at these two. Okay, I have some things on the chat screen saying, 
this early in the morning. I went on a sabbatical from my work today. So my colleagues talked about, okay. Yes, I get most purposeful message. Have a victorious weekend. Uh, I'm not even a princess. I'm priceless. A prince doesn't even, don't even on my list. Okay. How to accept negative traits like being, okay. So thanks, thanks for those messages. Now just look at these two things. I'm reading this message. I think it's possible for ordinary people to choose to be extraordinary and I'm an ordinary person. Now I'm looking at this and saying, okay, this is great. This is, an, this is a great idea, but how do I, how do I do this? How do I become extraordinary? This is Robin Sharma saying, we are all here for some special reason. Stop being a prisoner of your past, become the architect of your future, okay? This is another one saying sad, angry, upset, anxious, overwhelmed, unsure, afraid. And you can be all of this and still be positive. Now, here's the point that I'm trying to make. Many times these messages are just ideas. And one of the ways for you to bring, your, bring positivity from being an idea into, into action, into your life, is for you to keep your eyes open for things to do. Happiness is a mood, positivity is an emotion. By the way, none of these are my things I've written. Uh, this one just says, stay positive, okay? A positive mindset comes from making a conscious, continuous decision to choose positivity. Once again, how do you do this? How do I make a continuous, conscious decision to choose positivity? Now, here's something interesting, and this is what I mean by look out for action. Today will be amazing, so wake up and smile. Positivity is a choice that becomes a lifestyle. In this entire page, in this entire, on this entire slide, there's one thing for you to pick up. Just this line, wake up and smile. Wake up and, and smile is something very specific. When I read it, I know what to do. I can wake up in the morning and, 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 and smile. If I tell all of you smile right now, you know exactly what to do. Here's something else. But Tony Robbins, which says, create a vision, never let the environment or other people's limiting belief uh, or what has been done in the past limit your decisions. Once again, doesn't tell you what to do. Here's something by Robin Sharma again. Out of, the, out of this list of eight things or eight ideas, I will speak of solutions versus problems. This gives me some sense of what to do. I'll outmanage, outimagine, and outwork all around me. I'll find time for being for beauty joy and peace. This, these three tell me somewhat what, what to do, but all these others, like I'll elevate my vitality, it doesn't really tell you. So ladies and gentlemen, I wanna just, I wanna just freeze the moment. These are people like Elon Musk, Tony Robbins and Robin Sharma, all of, all of who I admire and you know, people who I like, but I want you to be aware that even such people put out there many times just ideas. And I want you to make a fundamental distinction between what is an idea and what is a specific action. Here's something which I picked out from, from earlier this year, which said, to be happy this year, do all these things. Out of which, do something you love, makes sense. Listen to music, makes sense. If I tell you, listen to music, you know exactly what to do, right? Go for a walk. It's a very specific thing. It tells me what to do. Go gadget free once a week. Well, it tells me what to do. I can get rid of my phone, live without my phone once a week. I mean, it's questionable whether I can actually execute that, but it tells me what to do. Write five good things about yourself every day. Now, do you see the difference compared to, look at this, look at point number 10, 11, 12, and 13. Love yourself, love your body, let go of the past, forgive and forget. I think four nice ideas, very, very difficult to execute. And I think if you could tell somebody, love you, somebody who's overweight and ashamed of the way they look and they've had unfortunate incidents in the past, if you can tell them, love yourself, love your body, let go of the past and forgive and forget. And they say, wow, perfect, I know what to do. If this is the case, I don't think you need psychologists and, and therapists and coaches in the, in, in the world. So uh, my point to you is, there is a lot of, there are a lot of ideas out there. If you can look through my Instagram, uh, uh, you know, profile, you will see a lot of them are ideas. Be aware that some are just ideas. Some are things to do. And 
It's your responsibility to look at the world of positivity and draw from it things that you can actually do because that's what will help you take it to action. Most of the time, you, have, you end up with junk, which are things which, which don't tell you uh, anything specific, right? Okay, mm, wonderful presentation. It's very helpful. What's your Instagram ID? I, I'm sure somebody just put it up earlier. Just go up the, just go up the chat screen, you'll see it. Okay, in the meantime, let me move ahead. What time is it? Okay. So it's, it's pandemic times and I am really uh, sort of glad with the way India has dealt with this. Our numbers have been steadily dropping, but this being an international conference, I know that there are people from other countries and we have numbers rising in place, place, places like Spain. I spoke to somebody who said they've gone back to where they were in, in April. And uh, I think UK numbers are increasing. So I think this, this, my presentation would be incomplete if I don't say some things about the pandemic. And especially in keeping with the, the theme of this, this talk, using positive psychology to live a better life, but particularly during a pandemic, okay? Okay, so what do I have to say about this slide? Okay, so this is, um, I just watched the video that you just played. This gentleman's picture is also there. The one on the right, his name is Aaron Beck. So Aaron Beck was a psychiatrist from the University of Pennsylvania and uh, he's still alive. He's about 99 years old. He was really known for what, what's called cognitive therapy, okay? And the one on the left is what, who I spoke about earlier, Martin Seligman. This is, I think, a great picture of both of them. But um, there's an idea that Aaron Beck came up with related to cognitive therapy which was later picked up by Martin Seligman and which he wrote about and developed into what's called learned optimism. And they looked at what optimists do and what pessimists do. And they saw that there were some clear differences. And I think in those differences lie some of the secrets of dealing with tough times, not just like a pandemic, but any tough time in your life. You know, anytime you're going through bad things, this is something which you can do. Uh, I'm, I always encourage people to tell themselves the right thing. And when I say tell yourself the right thing, in your head, if you like also aloud, but, but particularly in your head, you become what you keep telling yourself. You keep telling yourself you're, a, you're an idiot. You'll sort of live up to that, that philosophy. If you keep telling yourself that you're awesome, if, you keep, if I keep telling myself I'm awesome, I'm gonna keep doing things which, which match that. So the first one, this is what pessimists do. When things are not going well, uh, suppose they get fired, you know, because of the market condition, they lost their job. This loss of a job becomes pervasive. It enters all areas of their life. They say, I've lost my job. So, you know, my working life is gone. Now I can't go meet my friends because they have jobs. I don't have a job. So my social life is gone. If I don't have a job, what will my wife or husband think of me? So my personal life is gone. You know, it goes into all areas of their life. One of the things that you could do as an optimist and to deal with tough times, if something bad happens, if you lose your job, say, hey, I still have a great family. I still have money in the bank. I still have great friends who will support me. You know, realize that this is not your whole life. This is just a job. So this is one of the things you can tell yourself. Tell yourself things which reaffirm the idea that bad things are not pervasive. Second, personalization. Pessimists tend to do this when something goes wrong. I lose my job and then I say, I'm useless because I lost my job, you know? I break up and I say, I'm a lousy boyfriend or a husband or, you know, or whatever. Uh, so you, you, the problem becomes, becomes you. So sometimes it's good to realize and tell yourself, oh, I lost my job. <laughs> what do you expect in a market like this? You know, and, and things are gonna get better. So that's something which you can tell yourself. Remember, it's not personal. Not everything is your fault. People who uh, have this problem, if somebody doesn't call you or return your call, you tend to think that you're not call worthy, but that's not the case. It's likely that that person's just busy. And thirdly, permanence. Uh, you know, this is also something which pessimists do. When things go bad, I don't have a job. They think I will never get a job. You know, have you ever had a, had a migraine, a headache or a, or a hangover? When you're having that hangover, when you're having that migraine, or that headache, you feel it will never get over. This headache will be there forever. You think it's permanent. So tell yourself things like, this too shall pass. 
things are getting better. I can feel it getting better, you know? This sort of positive self-talk helps you get over tough times. So I hope that gives you an idea of, of dealing with pandemic. Let me give you one more thing. This is about what you tell yourself, you know, tell yourself the right thing, but also make sure you do the right thing. What do I mean by that? You know, this particular slide became extremely popular during the pandemic with people who attended my sessions. Uh, without getting much into the details, I'll just tell you briefly about it. You know, dopamine is a hormone which um, is, is a feel-good hormone. It's a pleasure hormone. Let me just simplify the explanation so that just remember it as a pleasure hormone. Okay. Serotonin is a hormone which is uh, generally used for to, to help you uh, stabilize your mood and get a get a good sense of well-being. Okay. Endorphins are pain and stress relieving hormones, and oxytocin you must have heard about. It's the love hormone or the cuddle hormone. You know, the beautiful thing about hormones is if the hormone gets into your bloodstream, it's going to do its job. You know, like adrenaline. When adrenaline is pumped into the blood, it's a fight or flight hormone. You feel like attacking or running away. Okay. Just like that, if any of these hormones are released, released into your blood, you have no choice but to feel good because they're, they're happy hormones. So here are some things you could do. Laughter. Watch anything that will make you laugh. Talk to a person that will make you laugh. Watch some stand-up comedy show. Watch some previous recording. Think about a time which made you laugh and you'll laugh again. So this releases dopamine and endorphins. Meditate. Those of you who meditate, you can do this. If you don't know how to meditate, you can just go look at my podcast channel. It's called the Positive Behavior Podcast. There are a couple of different types of meditation uh, and you can listen to it. So when you meditate, dopamine and serotonin are released. Walk, so you can just walk and exercise. You know, when I, when I came up with these things, I particularly picked things which people could use during a lockdown by themselves without the help of another person, you know, or you do on the phone. So you can, you can try this out. Sunlight, if you have a balcony, if you have some place in your house which has sunlight, just go and expose yourself to the, to the sun. That releases endorphins and, and serotonin. Cuddling and having sex, so if you want to release oxytocin, cuddling, not just with a person, also with a pet, sometimes also talking like that over the phone with somebody. You know, if you, if you, have, a, if you have a son who's in another city or a daughter who's in another city, very small, you know, talk, talking and petting them over the phone will release oxytocin. Great music. You know, every once in a while, we have these songs which we want to listen to and listen to again and listen to again and listen to again till it stops sort of giving us that orgasm. That's the kind of song you should listen to. That's what I mean by great music, not necessarily, you know, what the internet classifies as great. What is great for you? What makes you feel good? That releases dopamine. And finally, if you're listening to this saying, oh, I don't have a girlfriend or a boyfriend. I'm not in a relationship. What do I do? I don't have a pet. Well, you can just eat together. Sharing a meal is a great way to release oxytocin. Also watching, doing, acts of kindness, being kind to somebody, donating money, even these things would release oxytocin. So these are things that you could do to help you get over turbulent times. Okay, so I want to just end with one or two ideas before I take questions. Okay, so we have about 10 more minutes. Uh, any discussion about positive psychology, I think is incomplete without talking about relationships. Okay, and I already told you about Aaron Beck and um, you know, Martin Seligman. I know there are a lot of sciencey people here. So if you have a great interest in reading more about it, uh, you can read some, there's a very popular research paper by both of them and uh, Stephen Mayer and a bunch of other people. It's called Beyond Depression. You can read that research paper. It's a fantastic paper. It's not recent, it must be almost 10 years old now, but it's a, it's a great foundational piece of work on which a lot of, a lot of current research is happening. Uh, like that, there's another interesting piece of research which happened at Harvard, which is called the Harvard Study on Adult Development. You can search for this on Google, you won't miss it. Harvard Study on Ad Adult Development. Okay, uh, it's by this gentleman called Robert Waldinger. Essentially, they caught a bunch of people who were studying at Harvard in 1938 and they followed their lives. And they realized relationships are one of the uh, one of the big things which makes you have a good life, makes you live happily and so on. 
so this is something which came to me you know i have a friend called varun varun sharma varun right now is a he teaches he's a, he's a professor in the university of tejpur but this is many years ago i met him once and every time we meet we have a great time and then the next time i met him he was married so i met him and his wife again we talk about great things we we were schoolmates we studied in the same class in school then i met him another time after 3 4 years and then we spoke then and we said look in the last 10 years i've met you just thrice and we matter to each other so much and that time we just turned 30 so imagine we live till say 70 okay so that's 40 50 60 70 we just have about we met three times in 10 years we just have about 12 meetings left and this idea sort of shocked him i also shocked myself with it and i realized sometimes the people we care about most we underestimate the number of times we might meet them before they die or before you yourself die right so here's what i have to say to you make a list of those top few people in your life if you're spending every day with them fantastic if you're not if you live in bangalore or if you live in the us and your parents are in are in india and you come once in 3 years to visit them and they are 70 it's likely that you have just two or three meetings left with them and that's something for you to worry about and think about and uh, pick up the phone and call those people who you care about tell them hey i how are you doing what's happening let's plan to meet let's let's make plans uh, i'll visit you you can visit me and and so on so those handful of 10 or 12 people if you're not spending quality time with them i think then we are all missing the plot that's something for you to uh, take back because the key to this business is human relationships and uh, if you can have better quality relationships especially with those people who matter to you it doesn't matter that you have a great relationship with some random joe who you are running in the park with you know or who you meet uh, in the neighboring office what matters is how good your relationship is with the people you live with the pe- your close friends your immediate neighbors you know the, and your inner circle of of your life uh okay so before i take questions let's try this exercise i want you to okay let me just look at the chat screen very briefly thank you what if the people who matter and mean to you don't show the same interest well here's what i here's i would I, who whose question was that one second okay nilofer here's what i suggest you have limited control over what other people can do you have a lot of control over what you can do i recommended a book earlier in in the session called man search for meaning that's essentially what it's about you do your part and you know after some time if you feel that that person's just not responding hey you know there's another bus every 15 minutes so build new relationships while you're still young with people who matter to you i know some people who don't have a great relationship with their with their life partners but they've sort of substituted that while still being married to the same person they've sort of st- substituted that with other people in their lives you know it's not the best thing possible but it's what's possible and sometimes you have to choose between what's available to you uh, rather than worry about what's not available okay all right so here's the exercise which i want you to do now look at this girl i want you to smile okay don't do this yet let me just tell you what it is and you can keep doing this while i also take questions just listen to me first don't start doing it yet uh i want you to smile and keep your eyeballs facing up and this is a great way any time in life if you're not feeling good if you're feeling a little down if you're not feeling upbeat if you're feeling like oh i'm not feeling great i don't know why i don't nothing happened but i'm still not feeling that great here's what you should do just smile okay and look up okay don't do it yet just watch me i, I hope you can see my eyes don't look up that much because when you do that your head's going to start hurting don't smile so much you know if you have this unusual huge smile you're going to feel artificial about it smile very slightly just look at this girl you can almost look at her and wonder is she really smiling but you know she is smiling she's smiling very slightly so smile slightly and then look up if you were in a room like uh, 
you know, an eight by 10 by 10 room, you should be standing in gently like looking at towards the ceiling. So comfortably up, that's it. So look up and smile slightly. Okay, now you can do it while I keep talking. So as you smile and look up slightly, okay, don't worry about looking at me in the screen. I'll just keep talking. As you smile and look up slightly, you're going to have the sensation like, what am I doing? Oh God, this is not, <laughs> this is so funny. It's okay. Just stick with it. Stick with it. And if you're doing it right, you're going to slowly start feeling like smiling a little more. Okay. You're going to slowly start feeling like smiling a little more automatically without you trying to, without you trying to sort of push it. Okay. You're going to automatically start feeling like smiling a little more and then keep at it keep at it, keep at it. And then you're gonna feel like smiling a little more. Okay, those of you who are doing this from wherever you're watching, I don't know, there are like 500 plus people here. And I think there are a few thousand people on YouTube live and Facebook live and wherever this is being, uh, you know, live cast. So if you're doing this and if you're doing it right, you should already be feeling slightly better than when you started doing it for no reason. And that's okay, right? So keep doing it, keep holding on to this. And after a while, you'll realize that you're smiling like this girl on the screen or this woman on the screen. You're feeling like you're feeling like really smiling and, you know, you're really feeling much better. So this it's an experiment which I've done with large groups, small groups, with individual people I've coached. You know, sometimes a lot of my clientele is corporate. They walk in after a distressed meeting and they're sitting in the coaching session. So I get them to do this to start feeling good before they talk to me. Okay, so keep doing that I, as, for as long as you're comfortable. I'm happy to take questions. I'm going to look back at the chat screen and look at all the questions. Um, I, uh, before I say thank you, I'm going to just share some of my details with you here if you want to get in touch. Well, that's the fastest way to get in touch with me. That's my mobile number and that's my Gmail ID. Do stick on for the Q&A session because in many of my sessions, uh, you know, People have come back and said, I learned much more from the Q&A than the rest of the session. So do stick on. So that's my mobile number and, and that's my email ID. You can also go to my website to get a sense of what else I do and what values I bring onto the table as a consultant. I keep telling people, you know, one of my roles as a consultant is that you know, this, the world is and the internet is full of theories, concepts, research papers, TED talks, videos. One of my jobs is to filter that nonsense and bring to my clients what what's useful to them, right? So it's nice to have somebody else offer that service to you. If you're a very young person like Joel and his uh, extended team, and you prefer texting than talking, then you can go to my Instagram profile or my LinkedIn page. That's a good way to get in touch with me. You can also, by the way, this is, this is all free content, guys. You can go to my podcast. There's, there's at least a few hours of free material there. You can listen to it. Uh, you don't have to pay for it. But please send me a message if it worked for you and if something helped, it might just feature in my upcoming articles. You can go to my blog, which is psychologyofhumanbehavior.com. There's, there's a lot of stuff out there, which is, which is free, a lot of articles. You can buy my book. It's not free, but there's a Kindle edition, which is, which is very uh, cheap, uh, very inexpensive. You can, you can pick that up or you can buy the hard copy of the book and you can read it. It has a lot of things I've been talking about. Mm. So let's take some questions. So like one person has asked, what are the therapies mm. that include in positive psychology? Uh, come again, come again. What are the therapies that are included uh -huh. in positive psychology? Yeah. So here's the thing. Uh, you know, I, I don't even know if the word therapy is uh, appropriate. It, it's like a, it's a malapropic statement, right? Saying, uh, therapy when you're already working with people who don't need therapy, okay? But here are some things which have worked and one of the realizations that a lot of the teachers and uh, psychologists had with respect to positive psychology is, if I'm teaching a normal person about depression or acute neurotic depression or, or mania or paranoia, it's very difficult for me to tell this person what that feels like. But one of the great benefits of positive psychology is I can tell you to do some exercises. So what 
normally if you're talking about what a development intervention, I wouldn't call it therapy, what a development intervention would look like, it would be exercises. One of the most popular ones is, is what's called the gratitude list, making a list of things that you're grateful for, reading it from time to time. You should look up the work of um, uh, this gentleman called Robert Biswas Diner. He has a he has a course online. He has also a number of things that he's written uh, about this. Some of the other things would be looking at your strengths, identifying your strengths, looking at ways to explore your strengths, looking at your values. What is it that you value the most? And can you live a life where those values are expressed? Imagine one of your values is not, one of your values is honesty. And your life will be miserable simply because you're a sales guy in a company which promotes dishonesty. So a lot of the things that you will do in the form of improving people's lives, or if you want to call it therapy, is about helping them use these things. Some of the stronger ideas, if you want to explore, is something called as post-traumatic. We keep hearing about PTSD. There's something called as PTS, a post-traumatic PTG, a post-traumatic growth. Okay, saying going through tough times doesn't mean you'll be bruised after that. You might actually come out stronger. There's an entire field of mental toughness. You can look up the works of uh, uh, Barbara Fredrickson. I think she's written a book called Grit, where she's done a lot of research on that. That's, that's maybe a good book to read. OK, next. Joel? So, uh, what, would be the, what would be the reason for one searching for happiness? Yeah. You know, I made a, I made a podcast about this. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was an idea inspired by uh, Eckhart Tolle's book, The Power of Now. And uh, somebody asked him the same question. He says, why should I be happy? You know, what's the problem with not being happy? And Eckhart Tolle says, well, there is nothing wrong with not being happy. But the point is, if you have a choice, if you have to choose between happiness and and sadness or not being happy. And if you're still choosing sadness, then that's something for you to think about. So Eckhart Tolle says that if you have a choice, it makes sense to choose happiness. But here's what I would say. If somebody is saying that, you know, I don't want to feel happy, I want to feel neutral. Okay. And if that the whole intention is to, is to feel neutral. Now, if you choose neutrality or indifference, okay, sometimes this happens, you know, when you're having a a fight or an argument or a disagreement with somebody in your life, a friend or a partner or a, you know, a business associate or a client, you kept calling the client, calling the client, calling the client. Okay. The client never picked up the phone. Now you're saying, I'm not going to be happy about this. I'm going to be indifferent. Let the client call. I'm going to be indifferent. I'm not going to pick up the call. Now that indifference actually makes you feel good. So eventually happiness is more of a default state. Even if you try to be neutral, that neutralness will make you happy. You'll be happy that you're neutral, okay? I don't think you'll be sad that you're neutral because you'll be going after what you want. And when you get what you want, you're likely to feel happy as a default, you know, movement of, of, of energy levels or feelings or experiences. And I think we have to accept at some point that we have less control over that. Okay. So What's I have this? a doubt like regarding, you told about positive psychology, how you have been applying them. So like you told that there's a lot of information in this world in internet, like TED Talks, a lot of information. So as a person, how can we choose which is right for us? And how did you uh, come up in, a, in your profession, positive psychology? What made you feel that, okay, this is what the client needs. This is what where we should supply from. Like this is where we should provide. How did you find out, sir? Uh, see, it's, uh, I mean, I think more than uh, what I studied or worked on the research or my master's degree or, or, or whatever, one of the things that has really helped me uh, understand positive psychology is the number of years of meditation that I've done. So I was just sharing with my brother recently, you know, when we were sitting at home and chatting earlier this week, that I started meditating in the year 1998, okay? And I've meditated almost every single day, day since then, okay? And I think that's taught me a lot of things and some things just come to you intuitively. So I, I you know, I really don't have a black and white answer. I, I can't even promise that I chose it. I probably realized it later when I look back and say, 
what really helped me do this? And then I realized that, you know, I think I do, made these choices because I was more relaxed at that point. And I was more relaxed because I meditated. So that's the, that's what happened in my life. So my life is probably a, a, a bad example for somebody else to follow because it was a series of accidents which came out right. But uh, if somebody was to really do this now, I think uh, maybe doing a strong program in, in, in positive psychology, like an undergrad degree in psychology would help. I mean, I don't even fall, I don't even qualify for that because I have an undergrad degree in mechanical engineering. So I would consider myself as a wild card entry into the world of positive psychology, you know? But if somebody really wants to do it now, I think an undergrad degree in psychology is great. And if you realize that you enjoy the positive psychology dimensions of it, some of the programs to do, UPenn, University of Pennsylvania has a program called MAP, Masters of Applied Positive, Psycho Applied Positive Psychology, MAPP. Uh, you can look that up. It's a very expensive program, but many people I mentioned here teach in that program. Then you can look up a program called, uh, the oldest program in Europe is a program from the University of East London, also called MAP, or I think it's just called, yeah, it's called MAP. I think it's called MAP. You know, you can look up University of East London. They have a program. If you're still undecided at, at the master's level and you're wondering, is this for me? Then uh, UCLA has a program, uh, which is a program on applied psychology. They have a great master's program on applied psychology. And then you can decide uh, what you can do. And that, Joel, will answer the question of how do you learn something? How do you apply? Because for me, I've been using positive psychology even before I realized that it was called positive psychology. Later, I just had a, an epiphany of uh, sorts saying, oh, wow, now there's a name for it. <laughs> okay. So Wait, maybe that's Thank a good you, program uh, to do. During before sessions and all do it. <laughs>